stand to your feet, if you would, with me as we open this time with just a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for an opportunity that we have to gather together and worship you, God. And God, today, no doubt, uh, with the people here, the people online, we, we gather today with just different things that we've gone through over the week, and even this weekend, and maybe even this morning, uh, whether it just be stuff in life that we're dealing with. But today, Father God, would we just have an opportunity just to, to put our joy in you as we worship you as we open your word father god would your word just be a, a a clear word of truth to our hearts today and today father god we would just experience you in a way that we need to father god would you uh just uh speak to us and allow us to listen god in christ's name we pray amen Hey, I just want to say and take a moment to say welcome. We are so glad you're here again, whether you're here, whether you're joining us online, wherever that may be. We're excited you're here. We're going to be talking about joy today. Pastor David's going to be opening the book of Philippians. We'll be talking about joy. And so I hope that that rings in your heart today. Go ahead and, and join the band as they lead you in worship. It is good to be here today and be with you guys. Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name most high. To declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. With a ten-stringed harp and the music of a lyre. For you have made me rejoice, Lord, by what you have done. I will shout for joy because of the works of your hands. How magnificent are your works, Lord. How profound your thoughts. So whatever's on your mind, your heart this morning, whatever you've got carrying in with you, just lay it down for the next hour. and Let's sing the praises of our Lord and uh, hear a word from him. Let's sing together.
taught you guys this new song and the Bible teaches us to, uh, to sing a new song to our Father so let's do just that. I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover signs and wonders I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get over my faith is registered in heaven my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from the He is not done with us. Let's sing this out. If I'm not dead, you're not dead. Bigger things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not dead. Bigger things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not dead. Story, I'll testify about Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. From death to life, this grace rewrote my story. I'll testify about Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm justified. This is my this is my testimony. 
Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. And through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. That we will rise again. For I believe in the name our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son. The Bible speaks about joy a lot. Um, in the Old Testament, when the people had just rebuilt the wall that was torn down, Ezra steps up to the plate, reads the, reads the scriptures to them, 
and then just says this to a beleaguered people. The, 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 jo the, the joy in your life comes from God's strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength, he declares. The psalmist speaks over and over again about how knowing God brings joy in his life. The prophets speak about the coming Messiah, that he would be a person of joy. Jesus, in his last few moments with his disciples out of John 15, says, I am teaching you all these things so that my joy may be complete in you. I, I truly believe that God wants us to experience joy in our lives. Right? And we're going to discover that this morning out of the book of Philippians. But Paul in the book of Romans gives a closing prayer um, to the readers of that letter, to the church that was gathered at Rome. And this was his closing prayer. Now may the God of hope fill you with all his joy and all his peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we want to thank you for being the author of joy. <laughs> that in you is joy perfected. In you is peace proclaimed. In you is life itself. And Lord, today we just come before you a, a people that have been, some of us have been just beaten up by life beaten up by circumstances, things we've had to deal with in the past week or two weeks or months have really taken its toll on us, Lord. And I, we just ask that you would just fill us back to capacity with your peace, with your joy, with your grace, with your love, with your forgiveness. So that, Lord, that everything that you want us to attain in this life, we might through the empowerment of Jesus Christ. So Lord, today as we open up your word in Philippians, may, Father, what you inspired Paul through the power of your Holy Spirit connect with our hearts and our spirit that we might be men and women filled with your joy. In Jesus' name I pray. If you have a seat, just I invite you to take out your Bibles or if you're an electronic copy of, of God's Word to uh, the book of Philippians. And we'll be looking at uh, chapter 3 this morning. Um, I was digging around in my truck and I came across this little gem. I'm not sure if you know what this is. I hold my hand. I hold a map. This map is so old that it still has Governor Blunt on the, on the back cover. So <laughs> I think it was like 2006, something like that. But um, this was in the very bottom of my truck. Maybe you guys have this. Maybe some of the old timers like me. I'm an old timer now. I'm 50 years old, 51. So maybe you have this in your glove compartment. But uh, if you were driving before um, 2004, you had the, the awesome privilege of using this um, to get to your destination. In reality, if you're planning a long trip anywhere in the United States, you would have to do so by getting out a map or an atlas and figuring out how you're going to get there. Even if you're driving across town. Um, you would have you would use a map, and if you live in a major city like Springfield or Kansas City or St. Louis, it comes with a handy dandy uh, city map, a part of the thing. So, uh, for me, maps are cumbersome. There's some things on a map that I just couldn't figure out. Right? What's the red triangles mean? What's the blue lines mean? What's the black lines mean? What are, what are the double lines mean? What do the single lines mean? There's a lot of stuff that goes on to a map. But I'll tell you what. I'm so glad I still have this in my truck because you never know when the apocalypse is going to happen and it's going to wipe out everything. I know where to go to the bunker in the boot I know how to get there because I still have my Missouri <laughs> map with me, right? But along in 2004, something came along that kind of made this obsolete, this, this, this map obsolete, right? Uh, it was called TomTom. Tom. And TomTom Tom took a lot of the fun out of the experience of trying to figure out where to go on your destination. Tom Tom took away the conversations in the car, such as, um, are you looking at the map? Of course I'm looking at the map. 
right? How many arguments did you have in a car like that? You're riding shotgun, it was your responsibility to hold the map and tell the driver where to go, where to turn, how many miles before the next exit, right? And when you didn't do your job, um, there, an argument assumed that you'd say, well, you, you, you use the map, you read the map if you think you're better than me. You know, you ever had those conversations? <laughs> Am I the only one? Hello? Am I the only one over 50 around here? Well, TomTom Tom took away all those great experiences, those great conversations in the car, because now what TomTom Tom does is all you gotta do is put your, your, your point where you're at now, your, 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 desk, your place, and then you put your destination place in there, and this calm and soothing woman's voice, you know, gives you step-by-step -step directions to the place you want to go. Like I said, the Tom Tom is kind of taking out the joy of trying to figure out the destinations of where we're going in life. And Paul has taken out the frustrations regarding the destination of the pathway of joy for us. He's kind of given us a roadmap, per se, on how we can go about the joy in life. He gives a, a roadmap of joy in this great epistle called uh, Philippians. And in it, he's just, he's just a man showing gratitude because the church at Philippi had been such a tremendous partaker of him in the gospel, sharing the gospel and his missionary journeys, that Paul is just thankful, overflowing with gratefulness that he pens this letter. And a part of this letter, he begins to recount to them how they might live out joy in their life. And I, I think this is a fascinating thing because you would, you would never know what Paul's circumstances were, were like um, just by reading this letter. Yes, he does tell them what's going on in his life. But it doesn't tell, but what, what they don't discover is that what, how he's penning this letter is far beyond what he's really experiencing in his daily life. Because he comes from a heart of gratitude, he also begins to encourage them to live a life of joy. You see, he was, he was stuck between, or chained between two Roman guards 24 hours a day. His dignity stripped away. More than likely, he wasn't being fed properly. More than likely, his body was experiencing some, some physical trauma. He had gone through tremendous suffering. And he's in the midst of this dungeon where there's no natural light pouring in. And every time he's writing this letter, he, the, every letter, every stroke of that pen on that parchment, he's doing it in conjunction with the arm, with the hand of a Roman soldier chained to him. And for Paul, that dungeon, that experience, that situation that he found himself in did not control his heart. Something far greater had taken place in his life. He was not depressed but he had overcome the state of his circumstances. And the only way that I know how he overcame that was that he had this uncontrollable appetite to know more about Christ. He had this unconstrained love for Jesus that naturally came out, naturally produced in his heart an attitude of joy. And so this text this morning in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul shares with us several, several opportunities that we have to allow Christ to produce joy in our life as well. You know, this past uh, several months um, has taken its toll on us. And I believe that this message of joy is so much needed today, right? In the past six months, seven months, we've been told what we can and can't do anymore. There's a lot of things that we did for entertainment. We did that, that, that kind of gave us an escape from the realities of life that we no longer can partake in. Um, we're told how to, you know, what we had to do in public with one another. And so there's been a lot of stress put on relationships. People are more isolated now than ever before. Um, I was reading where antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication is in such high demand, it's putting a strain on, on the products. You know, there's not enough, the, the manufacturers can't keep up with the demand that's out there. Why is that? Because people have become depressed because of the state of their being, the state of their life, the state of calamity that seems to be around us. Not only are we experiencing a, a medical pandemic, but we're also experiencing a spiritual pandemic in our life today. And so for us, for us to, to understand what it means to go through life with great joy, 
Paul tells us exactly. He gives us two things. And listen, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel this morning. And I don't even think the Apostle Paul reinvents the wheel. Apostle, the Apostle Paul, all he does is basically says, this is how you go about experiencing joy in your life. No matter what your circumstances are, these are two things you can look forward to in order to have a heart of joy. The first thing that we can do to have joy in our life is this. Is that, is that you have to purposely, purposely pursue Christ in your life. Now look what Paul says in, in verse 12. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you agree, disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress that we have already made. Let me just add, the progress that we've already made in our walk with Jesus Christ. There is so much intensity in this chapter 3. And um, Pastor Tony last week kind of walked us through the first part of, of Paul's testimony. And there is such an intensity about Paul prior to him coming to faith in Christ. And that intensity never went away after he encountered Christ on that road to Damascus. Um, before Christ, and, and Paul said that it was just nothing more than a, a pile of horse manure compared to, to knowing Christ. And so now we're at the very heart of his testimony where he says, this is what has been produced in me that wasn't there prior to Christ. You see, he had a lot that he could hang his cap on regarding the successes in his life before Christ. But this man did not have peace. He did not have joy. But when he encountered Christ, he began to take a journey down the path of joy. Paul was a driven individual. Paul had no reverse in him. He had no neutral uh, gear in his mindset. It was everything before him he pursued with passion. Everything he did was focused attention. Everything he did was, was about purpose in life. Maybe you've met a person like that, right? Maybe you met a person that was just filled with passion, filled with zeal, filled with, you know, just this desire to take on the world. Maybe you're one of them, right? Now, there are two ways that I react to people that are just intense individuals. Sometimes I can be intimidated by them because they have so much energy, they have so much drive in their life, and they are, they are all over the place. But I also get a lot of inspiration from people like that. There's something about a person that is driven, a person that has a, a purpose in mind and is pursuing that purpose with all of their heart that gives inspiration to me that, that maybe it's possible in my life to, to be successful. Maybe it's possible in my life to achieve things as I see other people achieving what they do. Now, there's one particular person, and we can name a lot of people that inspire us that are driven in nature. Lately, I've just been very interested in, in a guy, he's a billionaire, by the way, named Elon Musk. You've heard of Elon Musk before, right? So Elon Musk just, I would say, in the, for me, it seems like the past 15 years, he just kind of comes out of nowhere, and he has all these goofy ideas, right? And this is what I love about it. Everyone kind of laughed at him at the very beginning, uh, kind of mocked his, his desires, but man, I'll tell you what, no one's laughing at him now, right? So many years ago, he had this desire. He thought, you know what? I think that cars need to run off of electricity, and I'm going to figure out a way to put electricity pumps all across America, and people are going to buy cars that run on electricity. And guess what? Um, people buy cars that run on electricity, right? And then he had another idea. He wasn't a, he wasn't a one gimmick guy. He had more plans. And so what he decided to do next was, you know what? I think it's possible for us to take a rocket ship, launch it from this launch pad, send it into outer space, and then we're going to bring back that... that um, uh, rocket back down and have it land straight up on the launching pad in which we launched it. And people are like, that is impossible, right? Well, guess what? Now we see that with SpaceX. That we can launch and it comes back and it's just this amazing thing. 
Now, now again, he's not a two-trick pony. I mean, he has other things up his sleeve. The latest thing that Elon Musk wants to do, he hasn't figured it out yet, but I think he will. Um, he says that there is enough gold in the asteroid belt surrounding Earth that if someone could figure out a way to mine the gold and other minerals in the asteroid belt, um, it'll far outdo any of the gold reserves that it's in, that's contained in the Earth. But, now listen, I don't know how he's, he's going to get a giant vacuum and just suck up all these little things. I have no idea how he's going to do it. But I believe that before I die, Elon Musk is going to figure out a way to do that. There's something about people who are driven that figure out how to get things done. And for Paul, he figured out how to have joy in his life. And he equates joy in his life by having a 100% a, a, a focus on Christ. You see, for him, he focused his life on Christ and Christ alone. And when, when he did that, then he began to grow spiritually. And as he began to grow spiritually, he had a tremendous impact through the, through the gospel and by the empowerment of, of Christ himself on his world and on, and on, on his generation and in generations to, uh, that, that, that came to pass in his life after he died. Then. And the same way can be said for you and I, right? That as we put Christ first in our life, if, if he becomes our, our singular focus, then, then naturally spiritual growth is going to take place in our life. And wherever spiritual growth takes place in our life, we're going to impact people around us in this world for the sake of the gospel. And I also believe that what happens in the process is that you begin to take on joy because there is no way that you can make an impact on, on the world um, as a follower of Christ and be a better person. There's no way that you can be and make an impact on the world and be a follower of Christ and have the gospel transform you and still be an angry individual. No, it just naturally produces great joy in our life. And so if you want to, experience, to pursue Christ and experience joy, then there's two things you're going to have to make a decision on on a, on a daily basis, right? The first thing you're going to have to do in order to experience joy in Christ on a daily basis is this. You're going to have to let your past remain in your past. That's what Paul says in, in verse 13. Forgetting. Forgetting the past. Whatever took place in the past it is now nothing more than a memory. Forgetting the past but looking forward to what lies Ahead, You see, joy can be elusive for us when all we're doing is looking behind us. Joy can be elusive for us today in the present and for tomorrow if we believe that our best days um, are behind us. Now, I've reached that 50-year-old 50, 50 club. I'm the half-century mark in my life. I'm 51 years old. And, and I'll just be honest with you that there are times that I struggle with looking back on my life and thinking, man, those were some awesome days. Those were some awesome times serving Jesus, doing this and traveling the world and doing all these things that if I'm not careful, I, I can get kind of stuck in a rut thinking, oh man, those are all my glory days and I have nothing left to give. There are times that I wonder at 51, do I, do I have the same um, get up and go for Jesus than I did when I was 21. And sometimes I look back at my 21 and go, man, those were some awesome days for Jesus. And then I think, wait a second, Myers, you were an idiot back then at 21, right? There was so much you didn't know, but you gave it your best shot in life. And, but at 51, I've been seasoned a little bit and I've matured a little bit, but there's more for me to offer at 51 than at 21. And sometimes I, I wonder, am I, am I useful for the kingdom of God at 51 than I was at 31. And, and this is what's really been bothering me lately is do I have the faith at 51 that I did when I was 41? When I was 41, I was going through a, a tremendous uh, time of that made me have to cling on to faith like never before in my life. But do I still have, do I still long for that in my life? You see, that's nostalgia. What I described was just nothing more than nostalgia that to look back on life and think, oh man, those were the dream days. When in reality, when I was 21 and 31 and 41, I experienced life crisis. It's like we all experience life crisis. I, mean, I, I experienced decisions I had to make that were, were life changing, just like you, you do the same thing in your life. There is a, 
a pastor in our community of a large church that has a tagline, the best is yet to come, right? And I believe that. I believe that as you walk with Jesus, as you know Jesus, as you pursue Jesus with all your heart, then you are saying the best is yet to come for me. If you're 61, if you're 71, if you're 81, if you're 91, the best is yet to come in your life. You just can't live in the past. You can't live in the past with your successes, nor can you look, live in the past with your failures. Often when Paul was saying, you know, forgetting what was behind, he was, he was forgetting what he thought was successful behind. But he was also willing to forget all of his mistakes, all of his sins. All the, all the hurts that he caused in his life, he was willing to leave that in the past as well. And for us, we sometimes we get so, we can shipwreck our faith and get sidelined in faith because we're, we're clinging to those hurts from our past, those failures in our past, and especially if those failures and hurts in our past are attached to personal sin in our life. Decisions we made that were out of bounds with the will of God for our life. And we think, you know what? I'm washed up. God cannot use me anymore. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. You see, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you, when you ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, guess what? All of your sins, all of your hurts, um, all, all, of your, all of your mistakes have been covered by the blood of Christ on Calvary. And, and when he sees you, he doesn't see you in your mistakes. He doesn't see you in your past sins. He doesn't see you in, in, in anything in your past failures in your life. He sees the blood of Christ over your life. And all is forgiven. So if God sees you as forgiven through the blood of Christ, then we ought to live as forgiven people. Not, not holding on to the past, but being set free to pursue him and to pursue as much as we can get out of life with tremendous joy. The second decision you're going to have to make in your daily life is this. You're, you're going to have to daily keep Jesus the main thing. If you're going to pursue Christ, then he has to be the main thing every single day. Look what he says in, in verse 14. Paul says, I press on. To reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Now, Paul uses the term press on twice in his testimony. And what he's doing is he's conveying a word picture for us. He's conveying the word picture of a, of a runner as he's running in a race. And this runner in the race, he wants to finish first in the race. And what happens when he comes to, when, a, when, a, when they're running in a race and there's a bunch of them at the very end, one will lunge his body forward to break the tape. And that is what he's saying in this moment. I am lunging forward on a daily basis. I am lunging forward to Christ. Because Christ is the very prize of life. To pursue Christ, you're going to have to have a ferocity or ferocity of spirit. You cannot follow Christ passively and get the same results of joy in your life. Joy comes when there is this ferocious desire to know Jesus and to pursue him and to walk with him no matter the cost, no matter the situation, that you pursue him above any and everything else that is going on in your life, that Jesus does not get kind of crowded out in the noise of life, but there is a singular fixation, focus, Every single day that Christ and Christ alone is my life. You see, some of us will have to get up in the morning and make this declaration in our life. That's Jesus. It is you and nothing but you. Um, you're brushing your teeth in the morning. You may need to make this declaration. Jesus, you are the main thing today in my life. As you're sitting in your car. You're driving down, driving down Glenstone and get caught up in that traffic. You know, um, and you look in the rearview mirror, maybe you need to say to yourself, Jesus, today, you're number one. Sitting at work, in your, your, your cubicle at work, and you're just kind of buried in work, to just to take a pause and say, Jesus, today, I'm keeping you the main thing in my life. Maybe you moms and dads who are at home 
raising the kids and taking care of the kids before the kids get up in the morning. Maybe you just need to take a, a deep breath over a cup of coffee and say, Jesus, today I just dedicate this day to you. Right? So allow Christ to become a focal point of why you get up on a daily basis. Right? And why you want to live today. Not for yourself, not for selfish pursuits, but to know him. And when you have this desire to know him, he is not going to back away from you, but he is going to give you himself. And when he does, you're going to see change in your life and joy is going to rub. Now, for some of us, we're just beaten down by life. Now, Paul, I believe it's Paul, the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, gives us some encouragement if we're just kind of beaten down when, when we, just, we just lost our focus on Christ. This is, what the, this is what the writer of Hebrews encourages. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. What? Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. The past is the past, right? And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And we do this. Here you go. Ding, ding, ding. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Isn't that amazing? Jesus had joy. When he went to the cross for you and I. That's another, that's another preaching point another time. Disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. There is so much to Jesus. That you can never exhaust the promises that he has for you. There is so much depth to knowing Christ that you're never going to mine at all in this lifetime. The promises of God in Christ Jesus are so innumerable that you are not going to be able to keep track of them in your pursuit of Christ. Beloved, don't have your fool of God too soon. Don't allow the world to strip you away from this desire to know him. And sometimes we get caught up in just being full of the things of God that we said no more. May that not be the case for you. May you not say, I've had my full of serving God. May you not, have, may you not come to a place in your life where you say, I, I'm done. I've had my full of fellowship. I've had my full of getting together and doing church with other believers. I pray that you'll never get to a place where you're just satisfied with the status quo in your life. But you're willing every day to press on and not lose heart because you allow Jesus to be the main thing in your life. So Paul says, here, here's the first part of the roadmap to joy, is you must pursue Christ, pursue him daily, pursue him with a ferocity in your life. And second of all, this is, this is awesome too. In verse 20 and 21, he says, we need to be men and women, men and women of faith, who look forward. Look forward to what? Look forward to heaven. You see, heaven is, 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 a, is a reward for us. Heaven is what spurs us on in joy. Look what he says in verse 20 and 21. He says, but we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are, we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. And he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. There is a joy that is produced within us when we are reminded that this world is not our last state. There is joy that, it, that comes upon us when we understand that, that life on this planet is fleeting. It's, it's, it may be for some of us who may last 100 plus, maybe 100, 105 years at the most. But most of us, our lives are very over with just like that. I myself understand that I have had more days behind me, numerically wise, than I have before me. But when I, when I look forward to what is, what is ahead of me, it's, it's not coming to an end on this earth. This is just a temporary spot for me. 
But what lies ahead of us for us for who are believers and followers of Jesus Christ, for us who are lovers of God because of, of, of our hope and faith in Christ, what waits for us is something more glorious than what we will ever experience on this earth. And let me say something. This earth is a beautiful place. There's some things on this, on this planet that when your eyes behold, whether that be the sunset, whether that be the mountains, whether that be the oceans, there are things on this earth that just kind of take your breath away because of its beauty. But what we know of heaven is that the beauty of heaven far outstrips the beauty of this earth. In Revelation chapter 5, we get a little glimpse into heaven. Actually, the whole book of Revelation kind of gives us a glimpse into heaven. And John's trying to describe what he is seeing in this vision of heaven. He's trying to put it into human words. And, and for the most part, his words, he can't find a true description of what he is seeing in heaven because it is mind-blowing to John and is breathtaking to John. And he does his very best to share with us what he is experiencing in this vision. And beloved, all I can tell you is that, is that what God has in store for us it blows our mind and our imagination regarding heaven. And that is for you and I. That is the place, that is our reward for trusting in Christ. He's giving us something that is beyond all comparison. And this world cannot compare to heaven at all in many regards. You see, this world where we're faced with a lot of, a lot of turmoil, a lot of troubles. Um, people that we love die. People, people in relationships that we build strong relationships to, they, we kind of break away. We have arguments. We, we have falling outs. Our bodies give way. Our bodies are, 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 are prone to disease and prone to sickness. Our bodies fall apart. There's things that go on in and around us that are beyond our control. But in heaven, it's so much different. In heaven, there is no more pain. No more wasting away of the body. No more sin, no more tears, no more struggle in heaven. There is no, there's no need for the sun in heaven because the Bible says God is present and his, his presence and his radiance lights up all of heaven. We know that heaven is vast beyond measure. We know that there's an economy in heaven and we will be a part of that economy in some way. We know that heaven is a place of worship and safety from the attacks of the devil. Isn't that great? We will no longer be harassed by Satan in heaven. We know that every day we get to behold our God and Savior for who he truly is. But here's the best part. Here's, here's, the, here's the great part. In verse 20 and 21, Paul says, we get new bodies. Can I get an amen from this crowd? We get a new body. This thing right here is not coming <laughs> with me, right? I'm going to wake up in heaven, um, David, but I, I'm hoping I have a, I knew I was going to have a perfected body. And so will you. So will you. The pains that you experience in your body, maybe you, maybe you have a disease you're, you're battling through in your body. The disease ain't coming with you. Amen. The frailties in your body, the limitations, are, it ain't coming with you. The handicaps that you may have been born with or that you may have acquired in life, they're not coming with you. When you close your eyes in death on this earth and you open your eyes immediately in heaven, you're still going to be you, but you're going to be given a glorified body. Amen. A perfected body. And that is a gift to you from God. And Paul is like, and Paul's writing, he goes, now listen, it's going to happen. And I can't wait for that moment. And it's going to happen because Jesus is going to do it for us because it's the same Jesus who created this world. He has the same ability to create a new body within me. And for Paul, that produced tremendous joy. Why? Because, like I said before my, in, the, in, in the introduction, he is suffering. And his body has taken a beating, a literal beating. Because of his faithfulness to Christ. And sitting in that Roman prison, he is emancip he's, he's wasting away. He's hungry. His body is breaking down. He's been abused. He's been tortured. And he's saying, man, <laughs> I get to exchange this for something better. 
And beloved, that's the same for you and I. You see, heaven ought, and the thought of heaven ought to be in the forefront of our mind just as Christ is in the forefront of our mind. To know every single day that we live is a day closer to heaven becoming a reality for us. And, and heaven for us, and this perfected body for us, and what we get to experience in heaven, listen, it's not just for a phase or a select moment of time. It is forever and ever and ever. And I'm not sure how you get your arms around forever and ever and ever. I can't begin to grasp that. But hallelujah, I get a perfected body forever and ever, and I get to exchange this body for however long I get to live these, these years on this earth, and same for you. There is no comparison. And so like Paul, have heaven in the forefront and esteem it to such a great degree in your life that you have joy in just thinking about the destiny of where God is taking you and I. If you're in this room this morning and you have given your heart to Jesus Christ, what, what awaits you is a life full of joy. And I am a firm believer, and this is, comes from the testimony of Paul, but also the, the record of, of Scripture as a whole, that we can have happiness and laughter, and we can do fun things in life without God. But we can never have true joy in our soul outside of knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of our lives. And if you're here this morning and you've never experienced true joy. I want to say this to you this morning. There's hope for you that all you must do is confess your sin and turn to Christ and ask Him to save you, to rescue you from your sins. That's simple. And if you're a follower of Christ and you've allowed the world with all of its cares to create these weeds that have choked out true joy in your heart, again, do what Paul says, forgetting what's in the past. And with a great ferocity, charge hard after Jesus. And listen, when you charge hard after Jesus, he's not going to become elusive. No, 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 no. He will allow you. He will allow you to draw near to him. And he will draw near to you. And in that, you will experience great joy. In that, you will be a man and woman of great purpose. In that, you will be a man and woman that the gospel changes forever, and then you will be a man or woman that will definitely make an impact on this world for Jesus Christ. Pursue Christ. Receive joy. Be overwhelmed by the thought of heaven and live a victorious life in Him. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this pronouncement this morning out of Philippians 3, that you, God, want to give us this joy. And Lord, we pray for that today. We hunger for that, Lord. And I, I ask that God that you would satisfy the hunger for joy in our life by allowing us, Lord, just to encounter you today, encounter you this coming week in our lives, that you might be glorified. For, the, for, our, for my brother and sister in, in the faith that are here this morning, that have just allowed the cares of the world to choke them, Lord, from experiencing your true joy, Lord, I pray that you would lead them back down the path of repentance. And in that moment of repentance, Lord, may they experience your joy again. So, Father, we just pray that, Lord, that you would continue to move in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, that in your word you show us, Lord, how to know you and how to, to suck the marrow out of life. And that is knowing you in all of your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. I invite you to stand and sing this last song with us. Sinners cross and your life.
Jesus said, uh, in this world, you'll experience trouble. You're going to experience tragedy. You're going to experience the times when you get your focus off me and experience poor choices and bad decisions and all that kind of stuff. But he said, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Which means that we not only have joy just in the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ when we put our hope and our trust in Him, but we have joy in what eternity holds right. in our lives. And so I hope, I hope that has given you joy today. I hope hearing the message of Philippians and, and Pastor Dave gives you joy as you leave uh, today. Just a reminder, we have connection cards spread throughout this place. And if you uh, need to connect with us in any way, please do. Uh, if you need to talk with someone after this uh, this service, uh, I will be available. Pastor Dave, Pastor Tony will be available. We'd love to, to chat with you if there's anything that we need to, to pray about or, or counsel with you. Um, our QR code is over there for our announcements that are kind of to keep in touch with what's going on at church. I do want to make one announcement. I'm going to have Melissa kind of help me with this. And this is a really cool opportunity because, you know, the church really needs to look at, at, at reaching out to the community in times of need. And school is really different this year for a lot of folks. And, and some are online, some are some are face-to-face, -face, some are some online and some face-to-face. -face. And so what, what they've come up with, Melissa's kind of come up with, is an opportunity to kind of help in the community, kind of to share what, what we're going to be doing. Yeah, so on Wednesdays after school gets started, we're going to open up our brand new student center and just invite 7th through 12th grade students to come in and do school here with us. Um, so they need to bring their Chromebooks, need to bring like earbuds, we do have to stay kind of quiet, um, but have the opportunity to, to have school with some other people. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes you need help as you, you encounter a problem or something you don't quite understand. And, um, you know, I've told them, hey, man, I'll do my best. It's been 20 years, but <laughs> I'll do my best if you need some help. And they can also help each other. Um, so it's just an opportunity for them to do school together. And we have how many openings for that at this point? Ten. Ten openings. So ten spots. Uh, and we're, we're reaching out to our folks first. At the, is that right? Yes. So for our families, and if you have, we have ten spots available. Once those spots are gone... At this point, they're gone, right? right. So uh, how can they sign up for that? Um, there's a few ways. You could just contact me or Cliff. Um, you could sign up on your connection card. Um, Tony sent out a link um, to where you could sign up online. Um, just just make sure we know you're coming. Okay. And the cost? No cost. No cost. That's even better, right? So, uh, so hey, if, if, if that can help you, if it can help you as a parent, uh, as can help you as, a, as an aunt, uncle, guardian of whoever, please uh, connect with that and, and see if that, that will uh, be a great ministry opportunity and hopefully you'll take advantage of that. God bless. I hope you experience joy today. I hope you experience joy this week as you go from here. You're dismissed. You have the grandkids. Hi. Yeah. Hi.